Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to um, our second annual Fusion Day and Fuse Talks. We have nine amazing students today who are going to share with you their capstone uh, scholarship and research. And so without uh, further ado, we will, uh, enter, or we will bring to the stage uh, our first faculty member who will introduce their student. I hope you enjoy these talks. Folks, well, it's my pleasure to introduce Lizzie Daggett today. Lizzie, would you like to come up? <laughs> and um, I am, I, I'm chair, my, my name is Scott Simmons. I'm chair of math and computer science. Lizzie is an honor student, and I am her honors advisor. Uh, she is a, an architecture major. And she, her, she has a certificate in international immersion and uh, in fact went to study abroad in Paris about a year ago. Um, now, Lizzie is also a computer science minor and because of that, she applied for and won a position at an REU in, um, <clears throat> this was back in during the pandemic years. What's an REU? An REU is an undergraduate research experience. And you go, typically for the summer, you get a stipend and you work on uh, a research project in conjunction with a faculty member. Lizzie did her REU at <clears throat> uh, Carolina State University, East Carolina University, sorry. And the topic was, was a computer science one. The topic was software and data analytics. Uh, now, I mention that because that was where Lizzie got good at doing meta-analyses with modern machine learning tools. And she, at that time, she's an architecture major, so she was interested in more of an architecture uh, data set. And so now, um, but now, fat, let's fast forward to now. Lizzie for the past six months has been doing another kind of meta-analysis with machine learning models, but on a supremely human topic. And now I must hand it over to Lizzie. <laughs> My name is Lizzie Daggett, and today I will be talking about machine learning and autism and facilitating early on diagnoses. Woo, too fast. Uh, so Scott introduced me. I'm architecture major with a comp sci minor. I really like doing ceramics. I've got a dog. Just some fun things about me. Um, and I also am involved with AIS, which is the big architecture club. And so I try to stay as involved as I can with the campus. So today I'm going to kind of do a little about and an intro about the topic, give you a bit of background. I've been working on a literature review, so we'll do a short touch on methodology. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about two articles that are gonna involve kind of a bit of a response of a raise of hands. And then I'm gonna talk about my future re research and kind of the conclusion that I've come to thus far. So a little bit about is I am learning about artificial intelligence using machine learning and deep learning and how people and scientists are using these different AIs to diagnose autism, which I think is like a big touchy thing. So what is autism? Uh, autism is characterized by communication deficits and the use of social, um, uh, 
funny word, <laughs> can't do it, Cecily's laughing at me, we're gonna skip that. Um, so what is machine learning though? It is training a computer to learn data analytics and to be able to run um, and basically do diagnostics on different set subjects. And so why is this important to me? It was because I was actually diagnosed with autism about two years ago, which is really late, that was in my 20s. Um, it's something I'm pretty open about and I think that makes me unique, it makes me me and I'm not like sad about it. And I thought it was interesting to hear that they're using machines to try to diagnose people. Um, I think that we go to doctors and doctors diagnose us and people go through years of college to be able to do that. Um, so my overall question is, should AI be replacing the way that we are diagnosing people? And I, throughout my literature review, I've asked more questions like, is this more cost effective? Is this gonna be quicker? Would I have been diagnosed sooner if a machine could have done analytics on me? Um, and I'm not really sure. So the, whoa. So the background is that machine learning is, uh, and deep learning is kind of the modern state for AI. Uh, primarily what I'm gonna talk about is how convolutional neural networks have been used, and those are the, two, uh, the big method that they've been using to diagnose using machine learning. So when it comes to autism, it's a nonlinear spectrum. It is a spectrum. There's different people, so I may not come off as autistic to everyone, um, where some people, you may look at them and you say, oh, maybe there's something wrong with them. We've got this stigma against people. Um, but they're using MRIs. They're looking at eye movement. They're even doing some facial analysis, which I'm going to talk about, um, and predictive analysis to see if they can diagnose sooner. So when it comes to methodology, I've looked at 11 articles, and I've got about 20 actually piled up, but for this talk, I'm specifically pr focusing on 11. Um, and a lot of it is this meta-analytic data. I've got uh, these different types of classifiers, which are the models, and the CNN is the big one. It's almost 100% accuracy, which is almost kind of scary. It's, uh, are these machines making too many assumptions? Why is it so accurate? And that's something that I've been asking. So this is where I'm gonna ask you guys to be involved. I got this picture on your guys' left. Do we think that this boy is um, autistic? Can you raise your hand if you think that he is? Okay, now on the right side, can you raise your hand if you think this child is autistic? So this is something that one of these machine learning algorithms is running, and it believed that the child on the left was autistic, and it was true. That is the conclusion that it came to. Same thing, I'm gonna ask, is this top row of children autistic? Do we think that this bottom row of children is autistic? No one raised hands, but that's cool. Um, the top row is autistic, and that is what the machine pulled, and personally, I think that if my face was thrown up there, it wouldn't know. Um, I think a lot of what this program did was assumptive, and it was used using a different classifier. Ooh, there we go. Um, and it goes through this set of imaging, it takes out different details, so facial features, the way that the nose is positioned, the way that the eyes are shaped, and it comes to this result and conclusion that it thinks that one person is autistic versus one person isn't. And I think that that is a little scary that we can be classified down to that. Um, when it comes to another example, we've got this medical device. It used not only two short videos, which were observational. Um, it was more than just numbers. It was more than just yes and no answers. And then it took some questionnaires. And what's really cool about this study is that it looked, it was looked through by actual people. It was being used as a pre-diagnostic tool instead of just making definitive diagnoses, kind of like that facial analysis one was looking at. So the big thing that comes with all of this research is this black box test black box testing. So we know what we're putting into the model. For example, with that imaging, we know that we're putting these pictures into the model, and then at the end it's telling us this person is autistic probably, this person is not autistic. Um, but we don't know how it's coming to that conclusion. It's training itself and it's learning, but we don't actually know what is happening in between all of that. And so the conclusion that I've come to is that I want to continue to ask students um, through neurodivergency classes and through site classes, what their opinions are. Specifically, does the accuracy of all of these models matter if we are not giving um, anything to make a dimensional diagnosis, if we're not giving it more context? Uh, again, the faces, it's really just a yes or no what it thinks and how does it actually come to that conclusion. 
So my thought is that it would actually be really great to be used as a pre-diagnostic tool. Uh, a lot of the studies that I read actually said that it was quite time consuming. Uh, it seemed like it would be over a year, which is about the typical time for a diagnosis anyways. Um, but it should not be used for a definitive diagnosis because again, there are a lot of people, they go and get their degrees, they spend years, eight plus years in college to be able to talk to people. Um, and so AI and machine learning, they apply this binary standard which cannot reasonably um, map ASD or autism spectrum disorder uh, through a diagnostic criteria because the criteria that are being used are dimensional and they're descriptive and machines just can't do that. So I'd like to thank Scott Simmons and also Cecily. Um, they've both helped me a lot and also shout out to Dr. Schur for honors. Yay! Um, thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Bob Weddle from the Architecture School, and I'm uh, lucky to be able to introduce Navi Nesh Gunalan, who will do the next talk. Uh, Navi is from Malaysia. He's a student who um, I think many of you know, um, very involved in campus activities. And for the past two years, Navi's been the president of our primary student group and has taken, taken a really active role in sort of building, rebuilding that group. And, passing it on to the next crew for next, uh, next year. Navi has interned uh, locally uh, for Burkholder Architects, and um, in June he's going to be moving to St. Louis to take a job with Trivers, um, who were involved in this building. Uh, and um, uh, Navi's going to be talking about the conclusions from his thesis project. Uh, the architecture students do a two-semester thesis. They do an intensive research-based semester in the fall, and then all spring is design work in which they test their assumptions and conclusions from their research that they did in the fall. So uh, there's a number of other fifth-year students in the audience, and they're all working towards their presentations next week. So if any of you are interested in what Navi and eventually Grant are going to talk about today, you'll see fifth-year reviews across the street next week on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Um, and I um, also want to just let you know that last week Navi was awarded um, the AIA Medal of Excellence, of Academic Excellence. It's a medal given to one architecture student in each school um, nationally, and so that's a really amazing accomplishment. So Navi's project is called the Suburban Infill, Reproposing the American Home. Navinesh Gunalan. Hello there, everyone. Uh, so, my project, well, thank you for Bob for introducing me that well, uh, it means a lot. Uh, so, my thesis that I worked on this whole year was Suburban Infill Reproposing the American Home. And, uh, perfect. So, my thesis statement is that in response to suburban poverty, which has been a long time effect of the, for, uh, the Great Recession and the foreclosure crisis, this project proposes infilling underutilized parking spots and uh, big box structures with ameliorate improved suburban housing model, which also includes a daycare. And I will talk more about it, which should, uh, and we go forward through this presentation. And it's, this project will create a dense, sustainable community for the new housing model. So to start off, we need to look at what Great Recession was. So when Great Recession happened, a lot of people lost, your, lost their homes and lost their jobs, which then led to the poverty rate being increased from 12.5% in 2007 to 13.5% in 2015. Same went to the unemployment rate from 128 to 79 And then foreclosure crisis forced people out of their suburban houses. And when they were forced out of their homes, they were put into affordable living. And affordable living doesn't really give them a dignified living they came to the suburbs for. You don't have a backyard, you don't have big living spaces, it's, you're in like a small shack. And yet the dignified living is taken away from you. And that was the suburban crisis where the suburbs housed the largest per population, which is 51%, and it was due to system failures, access issues, immigration, unemployment, etc. And there's also the topic of childcare. Nowadays, Raising a child is expensive, and putting a child in, health, uh, uh, in daycare 
takes about 30% of your household income. So a lot of parents, rather than enrolling kids in this expensive daycare, they just stay at home and take care of them, which takes away from their annual income. So my thing was, when I introduced this, there should be an affordable daycare inbuilt into this proposal. Oops. All right, so this was my opportunity that I looked at. Parking lots and big box structures and all stores. So as you can see, that is one building and that's the parking lot around it. You go to Battlefield Mall and you see the same exact thing happening. It's scattered around all across the suburbs in America and all this land could be used up for way better purposes. And most of these places go underutilized. Those places don't, you don't see a lot of people going, oops, okay. You don't see a lot of people going there. Uh, next up was, why did I say I want to do an improved suburban model? It's because the current suburbs have a lot of problems with them. One, that's so much houses that's spread across and taking up so much land. And then it's a great divide between residential and commercial. You gotta drive around to just go to another part of town to shop. And then you don't get neighborhood interactions. You're so far away from your neighbors. No one barely goes out. You don't talk to anyone. And community is the best thing about a neighborhood. So my site that I chose was Earth City in St. Louis. It's a big industrial hub, as you see in the middle picture over there. And I just took like the small chunk out of it where I'm gonna place my proposal on. And the reason why I chose that is because this Earth City was originally proposed as a live, work, learn, play, but due to that economic circumstances back then, they just decided to do a full industrial model. But, and I was like, well, why don't I introduce the housing that they thought of would work in this place? And also parking lots, as you see in this diagram, all the black is parking lots and the orange is building. There's clearly more parking lots and buildings. Oh. Okay, so the program that I'm trying to put into my proposal was residential, commercial, and daycare. And uh, it is, and the tough part during this whole thesis research was how do I find a balance between apartments and single family houses? Because those who are living in suburban houses do not want to go to an apartment. They don't want to share corridors. They don't want to go up in this big high rises. So how do I find this happy medium between these two places? And how do I create a private space for families, but also create a communal area that goes, works with it. These are some examples that I looked at. The first one is LTL Architects New Suburbanism. It's a, a research project that they did and where they used structures from the existing box, uh, big box stores underneath and they extruded them up to make the houses on top. And that was my main precedent. And then there's Unite Habitation by Corbusier where the commercial places was interlocked with the residences. And then in Mueller Austin, which is a, uh, a shared backyard, so all these houses share one common backyard, which introduces, which uh, brings in more interaction. And then there's the elevated park in Chapultepec, uh, Mexico, and this was mainly to study how I can make a really good rooftop model. So this was my biggest research that I went around warehouses to find. So as you can look, most warehouses have a typical structure, which is 20 by 20, it's like five feet beams that go across them, and I thought if I laid this on top of the warehouses that exist on my site, and I will extrude those columns to become my main structure for my, the, part of the houses that I'm introducing on top of them. So that shows that. This was my site plan. Uh, this was the first completed drawing that I did for this semester. The other three, 10 more are in the works. Uh, so this just shows an overall view of what my project would be like. So those to see the small boxes are the towers that I'm building on top of these warehouses and then I'm completely taking away the parking lots and I'm introducing commun uh, communal spaces on the ground floor with uh, daycare, playground, outdoor markets, more. I'll just go to the next one. So the floor plans, as you see, there are four options. There are two options for a double story and two options for a single story. And as you can see, I'm still keeping the yard. The yard is big enough to sustain, it's 15 feet by 40 feet, so it's a big yard. And then you, you have a big house and you have a kitchen, a big bedroom, and you have a lot of daylight, which is really lacking in some of the high rise residentials. So that's just an example of how my floor plans would be. And they'll be rotating as they go level by level. This is a streetscape plan that shows that uh, my commercial spaces are in front and my uh, garage is at the back. And that's so the garages are built in inside the warehouses and then the commercial spaces are built in front of them. And then you would take the elevator from the garage to go up to your rooftop where you walk to your units 
and then there'll be an elevator in, in, built inside your units where you take to go to each floor. Oops. So this is a final view of like what my proposal looks like. The warehouses are being turned into commercial spaces with doors and like frame, framing all their views and bringing people into customers inside. And there's a whole walkway in the middle and you see this towers, each level is one house. And it's just rotated to give daylight and to give more space for the people to breathe in and move around. And the top view is on top of the rooftop. If you're standing after coming up on the elevator, this is what you would see. And that rooftop functions as your new neighborhood. Each rooftop becomes a new neighborhood for the cluster of towers that are on top of them. And then what you see over here is the balcony look of the whole uh, plan in general. That's my final project. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Tony Smith, and I've taught Spanish here at Drury for the past uh, 11 years. This past summer, I led a study abroad trip to Spain in which our next speaker, Jamie Purcell, participated. I've had Jaylee in a total of four classes here at Drury, included a directed study abroad last, or a directed study last semester, where she worked on her video project about the Spain experience, about which she's gonna pr present here in a little bit. As the faculty leader of this trip, I can say that taking this students to Spain was one of the happiest and most rewarding chapters in my nearly 20 years of teaching college Spanish. Facing the uncertainties of returning to world travel and study abroad due to the pandemic, I'm grateful to both Jaylee and her 16 classmates, uh, some of which are here, some of which have graduated, uh, for giving me the chance to show them my most favorite place on earth. Um, I hope you enjoy Jaylee's story. So, Space Officer Purcell, are you ready? All right, I leave you in command. This past summer, 16 of my peers, Tony Smith and his family and I went on the adventure of a lifetime. We left our comfortable hometowns on an international flight to Barcelona, Spain. And from there, we toured cities all over the regions of Spain. My name is Jaylee Purcell and I'm a double major with computer science, software engineering and Spanish. This past fall semester, I completed the final project for the Get Out Plug-In Intercultural Connection Certificate. The goal of this project is to compile something that would relate to our futures to something that we had learned in Spain. So today I'm gonna to be talking about this project along with my experience in Spain. I chose, to make, oh, I chose to make a video for this project because video production has been a part of my life ever since I got a camera recording Barbie, Barbie doll in elementary school and being a part of video production in high school and now being in DUTV in college. I know the power that video has to draw attention to a cause and to inspire others. And so I wanted to make this video not only to reflect on our time in Spain, but to inspire others thinking about studying abroad. And so I also interviewed a few of my peers to get their perspective on the Spain experience. And I'll be showing you a little clip from this video about our first week in Spain. I started a time in Barcelona So that was a little clip from Abby Robertson about our first week in Spain. Some expect that once you step into another country, it's like you've stepped off into another planet. But for me, this wasn't the case. Maybe it was because we had a really knowledgeable trip leader or that we were trading one Western country for another. But I honestly experienced no culture shock. What could have been shock was turned into appreciation. I appreciated how cities prioritize people over cars and how there was cold cafe tables on the, on the streets and I appreciated how everywhere we went, there was a little bit of history to learn, whether it was the Roman built aqueducts in Segovia or the Muslim palace of the Alhambra in Granada. And of course the Spanish siesta, the time of day where families come home and take the time to have a meal with each other and just experience the, experiencing that was amazing. And so I hope if you find yourself in a similar situation, you'll appreciate 
the culture that you're learning instead of worrying if you look like an American tourist, because you will. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing I appreciated about being in Spain was learning directly from Spanish native speakers, not only at the host family home uh, or the people around us, but also at the University of Valladolid. So we had two classes. We had a culture class and a language class. In the culture class, we learned everything from the Spanish royal family to the different climates of the different regions of Spain. And our language teachers had ways of explaining tenses in ways that we never thought about before. And just, it really improved my Spanish um, understanding overall and developed my Spanish major. But of course, anyone studying abroad will find out that there will be some challenges. So this is what I would recommend. Uh, pack light. I packed a large suitcase and a carry-on and a personal item, despite Tony saying not to. But <laughs> I appreciated having the options of clothes, but I would go back and pack lighter had I had the opportunity. And just knowing that things may go wrong, but if you're well prepared, then you can just balance that out with just taking everything in and enjoying it while it lasts. And now I'd like to ask myself the same questions that I asked my interviewees about their experience in Spain. So what inspired me about Spain? For me, it was seeing all the Gaudi architecture. After all, he was the reason why I considered being an architecture major in the first place and why I looked into coming into jury. How was it like living with the host family? For me, it was unexpected since both of our parents worked and they weren't home as much, but we did have the added advantage of being the closest to school. And you can see our host mom there. What are your future plans and how do you see your time in Spain affecting them? For me, this isn't as clear of an answer since I see myself in a software engineer role of some type, but there are some things that I learned in Spain that I can connect to this, such as the motto of Spain in Latin is plus ultra, meaning go beyond. I feel like I do this as good a, I'm doing a good a job already, maintaining a good GPA and currently having 122 credits in my junior year. But I want to continue to go beyond and continue to practice, um, such as like coding interview questions, and I will say that in the internship that I got this summer in a panel interview, we talked two of the five minutes about my trip to Spain. So I think just having the communication skills and having the confidence to live in a new place is what made me hireable. And so if you're thinking about studying abroad, even if your major doesn't directly rate to relate to studying abroad, there's always something that you can learn about traveling to a new place. You can learn about different cultures and about different ways of living life. You can learn about the history of the place that you're staying in. And especially if there's a language component, you're learning a language that opens you up to another connection level that you didn't previously have before. And so, yeah, I would recommend it for everybody who's thinking about studying abroad. And you can watch this video now. It's 12 minutes in complete length. And this is my YouTube channel uh, if you want to go watch it now. So. Thank you. Thank you for listening, and I, thank you to, for all the administrators that had a hand in green lighting this trip. And I know we all really appreciated having the experience in Spain. Hello, my name is Darren Page. I uh, teach economics here in the Breach School of Business, and I'm pleased to introduce to you Matthew Dalton. Matthew is an economics major uh, in Breach, and he's going to talk to us today about uh, the life cycle hypothesis and some of the factors that might affect individual savings and consumption. But what you should know about Matthew is that, as far as I know, there are at least two other projects that he has either done himself or participated in here uh, at Drury that he could reasonably stand up here and teach us a lot about. So the other thing is Matthew will start his PhD at the University of Missouri in the fall. So if our future students are lucky, we may have him back as a professor in five years. That's the hope. But with that, I'm pleased to introduce to you Matthew Dalton. Okay, here we go. Well, you guys know my name, and the title of my research is Estimating Life Cycle Models and Application to Individual Savings, which is a lofty title for research that begins with a simple question. How does one uh, plan for retirement? 
So this question is lofty because it requires many things. Researchers would tell you you need to know how long you're going to live, how well you think financial markets will do in the future, and how much you want to spend on leisure activities when you're retired, things like pickleball or other things you plan on doing with your retirement. And with all this intimidating information in front of you, it may seem impossible to take yourself from where I am at 22 years old and retire by whatever age, 65, 70, whatever you select. But I went ahead and read some research about it anyway, and I found out a few interesting things. One, baby, baby boomers have exited the labor market at um, uh, uh, excuse me, an accelerated rate due to the pandemic. And researchers think that this will impact the private sector because one, we lose their human capital or the skills that they have. And we also lose out on uh, the savings that they have because as they're retired, they begin to draw out of their savings accounts, which can no longer be lent out by banks. In addition, millennials are struggling to save uh, due to student debts and increasing housing prices. Right now, millennials are beginning to reach the age in which they're expected to be saving more than they really are, which is troublesome for that generation. In addition, Social Security is expected to run out again. I think the new figure suggests that it's by 2035 we'll stop drawing off the interest of Social Security and actually get towards the fund itself that's used to generate uh, additional Social Security money in the future. So this is another troublesome thing for those planning to retire. And in addition, um, uh, the shift to defined contribution pensions or like 401ks, 403bs, make retirement savings more dependent upon uh, the success of financial markets. In the past, when we had uh, defined benefit uh, pensions, you had the ability to worry less about how the market was doing for your retirement funding. But now, saving for retirement and expecting uh, the proper outcomes in financial markets is even more important. So uh, with all of this research read, I learned a lot of facts. And at this point, I was no longer interested in a game plan from taking myself from 22 years old to 70 and retired. I just wanted to know how anybody thought about retirement in general. So naturally, I turned to what economists think about. And they suggested that a lot of people make their retirement decisions based off of a work-leisure model. The idea that you place a certain value on an hour of leisure and you get paid a certain wage. If your wage is higher than the hour that you place on leisure, you'll pick to work. And if it's the other way around, you'll pick to relax. And in these studies, economists also found out that people quickly drop out of the labor force between the ages of 60 and 70, which, no surprise, that's about when you can start drawing Social Security. And also, economists theorize that people uh, notice that with the lower amount of time that they have, they place a much higher value on leisure, so they elect to go into full retirement instead of continuing to work. But in addition, there's one other model that economists talk about and the one that's the focus of my research, and that is the life cycle hypothesis, which suggests that you make a certain income throughout your lifetime, which will fluctuate a lot, as represented by the green line in the graph. In addition, you'll consume at a certain level. Now, this level isn't completely flat, like the blue line in the graph suggests, but it shouldn't vary a lot throughout one's lifetime. It typically doesn't. And so in this case, we can get an idea of when you are, have periods of increasing and decreasing wealth. So the first area is when you might be a college student. At this point, you're paying for school and having to take out loans to pay for them. Your income is much lower than your level of consumption, and you have a period of decreasing wealth represented by the green area on the graph. But then you move on and you've graduated, you've got a great job, maybe you're five, 10 years out, and now you're saving money and paying off your debts and increasing your wealth represented by the blue area. And then later, you decide to uh, go into full retirement and just draw off your savings. You're decreasing your overall wealth, but you've saved it up over time. Really, you've earned it. So the idea of my research is to use ordinary least squares regression to create equations that represent both of these lines in the graph. So with that said, let's get into how I developed the model. I really based it off of a few things, and you may be uh, surprised or astonished to know there's not that much information required to guess how much money someone makes and how much money they spend. One is demographic information, like your race, education, the state you live in, gender, and other uh, personal information about you. In addition, we want to know about uh, the confidence that people have in the economy. If you're more confident in the economy, you might spend more or make more. Uh, the University of Michigan tracks this with surveys that send out to consumers every month. And then finally, the health of the economy, things like the GDP per capita, the GDP per capita growth rate, and the inflation rate. With all these things, I attempt to uh, model what individual levels of income look like and what individual levels of consumption look like. Because if you were a researcher or a financial planner, you might want to know what the graph that we saw on the last slide look, looks like for individual people or clients. And if you could do this, you could theoretically figure out how much money they were going to have over their lifetimes. So let's get into what the, uh, what the model came out with. And just to give you a sense of overall accuracy within the model, it could guess, um, it could guess means or averages within the population uh, with like plus or minus $3,000 for both consumption and for um, income. Meanwhile, for uh, individual values, they're trying to guess the individual 
uh, value of someone or the individual consumption or income that someone has, it was within the range of plus or minus $80,000. So it could definitely use some additional work, but let's go ahead and look at the results anyway. So what I did is I took the data set and I figured out the average statistics for current generations, which are baby boomers, Generation X, millennials, and Generation Z. And then I used the model to have it tell us how much they are going to make over their lifetimes, which is in blue, how much they're going to spend, which is in red, and how much they get to save, which is in green. And that's calculated by just taking the difference between their income and their consumption in that year. That's how much you get to save. And in this case, we noticed a few things. One, uh, the shape of our income, uh, of the income curve created by the model, does match up pretty well with our life cycle hypothesis, right? It has that area of increasing and then decreasing shape. And then consumption was less dramatic, which is good as well. We wanted it to be kind of flat. But you'll notice a few issues. For both the generations on screen now, you'll notice that neither of them had a period in which they were consuming more than they were spending, which research suggests is probably true. Most people are focused on spending just the money that they have rather than taking on additional debt. Um, and then in addition, over their lifetimes, they will make more and then make less. So these two are kind of uninteresting because they're pretty matching. But if we go to the next two, we get some interesting results. So again, those income curves are the same, same shape and in relatively the same area. You'll notice that consumption begins to fall quickly, which also matches up with what other researchers think. They suggest that future generations will have higher levels of saving, but lower levels of consumption during retirement, which is what both models suggest. And you may be saying, Matthew, there's no way that you can tell me how much an average Generation Z individual is going to be making in, uh, when they're 75 years old, because the data set has no real people that look like that. And that's one of the problems with extrapolating with data, and one of the reasons why the model is not completely accurate, but still has some value in telling us what these models look like and how the success of generations in the future. So let's move on to the conclusions. The bar graph here just shows you um, uh, it sums up all those green dots on every generation's graph and then shows you the sum total of their savings throughout their lifetime. In this case, you can see that the model thinks that the average Generation Z or millennial is getting anywhere between uh, 1.6 or $2.2 .2 million uh, over their entire lifetimes in terms of saving. That is probably not true, which is one of the issues with extrapolation, but still gives us some idea that there is probably an increasing level of savings in the future. So while the exact numbers may be off, the trend could be absolutely true as indicated by the model. But if we're assuming that the model is accurate anyway, we see that income doesn't change a whole lot throughout each generation, uh, that uh, expenditures are going to be constantly decreasing throughout each generation, and that uh, savings are increasing. But some of the issues with the model could be the data itself. So in this case, uh, the data that was put into the model, for example, like with consumption, was actually a survey where the Bureau of Labor Statistics called individuals and said, how much did you spend in the past week? That would get reported, and then the Bureau of Labor Statistics has a very complicated way of making this into an annual estimate, and they suggest that you just take the weekly number and multiply it by 52. So this could create some inaccuracy in the data that we have to worry about. And in addition, the modeling technique used, which was ordinary least squares regression, may not have been the best for the data at hand, but it's what we started with for just getting initial models created in research. And some references. Thanks, guys. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Okay. Matthew, I think I'm in the error part of your study as I do not have a million dollars in savings. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll get to working on it. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Jonathan Groves. I'm the department chair of communication, and I'm honored to introduce Raina Powell, who is one of our strategic communication students. She was honored last week as our top strategic communication student got the award from our department for that. Um, as part of that, in our strategic communication program, all throughout the program in our courses, our students are working with clients and they are doing real world projects. One of those classes is research and strategy, where we work with a client and we understand what their needs are and then our students provide them some insights. This past year, it was the Career Planning and Development Office at Drury, and Raina was one of the students who was part of that project, and she's going to share her insights, her individual insights, that were provided to the client. So, welcome. All right. Close your eyes. <laughs> All right, okay. So. In a few short weeks, Drury University will celebrate the graduation of hundreds of students who have demonstrated academic excellence in their final projects, exams, and papers. 
they're going to go home and their families are going to ask them, so, what are you going to do after college? <laughs> um, are these students really ready to communicate their knowledge, skills, experiences to uh, prospective employers? Are they ready to transition from college to the working, to a professional working life? Well, my name is Reina, and I got the opportunity to explore these questions in my, in Dr. Waters' COM 340 Advertising PR Research and Strategy class. And it's going to be right there where we learn how to use survey focus and focus group research in order to create informed and effective public relations and marketing communications campaigns. Today, I'm going to present to you some of our steps that we took as a class in order to do this research for our client, which was Jury's own career planning and development. The insights that I pulled from this research and how I used it to create research-backed recommendations for career planning and development to better meet their mission, which is to help students, prospective, current, and alum, uh, envision their professional, ac academic, and professional goals. So we began with two research questions, which were what actions do Jury University uh, students take already to prepare for their job search and what opportunities exist to enhance Jury students' readiness for that job search process. We began with secondary research, which was um, from outside sources such as scholarly articles and reputable press publications in order to get a full view of what the current trends and best practices are related to job search readiness and preparation. Then we conducted primary research, which involved collecting new data from, directly from Jury University students in order to, um, through an online survey and focus group sessions. So, um, I think I skipped one. Yeah, there we go. All right, so our survey was a 39 question survey with, well, that ran from November 7th through November 13th via a QR code on a flyer that I designed to our personal connections and any student that we could find in the wild. And I quickly found out I do not enjoy uh, interrupting students while they're eating in the FSC. Don't do it. <laughs> our survey evaluated students' actions to uh, that they were taking to prepare for their job search, their feelings towards job searching, and then general feelings that related to career planning and development. In total, our, race, our survey reached 178 students, present, uh, which represented a great variety of academic disciplines in year, which felt like a great accomplishment to us. And on November 8th, we um, executed three short student-led focus group sessions, which was pretty challenging considering we were pretty experienced moderators of focus groups. But in total, we had a turnout of 20 students uh, of varied majors and of over all academic disciplines, and the discussions that we had that day echoed and solidified the results that we had for our, that we got from our survey. So after collecting all of our data, we began to individually analyze the responses and to gain insights that our recommendations would be addressing for career planning and development. And I found three core themes of insights which addressed aspects of career planning and development from the inside of career planning and development to engaging Jury University students to expanding the Jury University students' um, professional networks. So my, whoa, <laughs> I love this thing. So my first insight was uh, that student feedback revealed a genuine disconnect between um, the services, location, and staff of career planning and development. And so my first proposal was largely based on the, re the timing of this research, and they were about to transition to the new Enterprise Center. And so I figured it would be a great time to uh, reintroduce career planning and development to students via a rebrand. And because I'm a graphic design minor, I decided to create a new logo for them, potential, and um, would be um, devised a way to introduce them with a new online presence. Okay, my second proposal stayed with this theme with the idea that working uh, with working that you would they would work with jury media students in order to create a series of educational posts about career planning and development for parents and students in space and these would be posted in spaces such as the jury Instagram and Facebook with a push to share with your student. Our results revealed that many students uh, visited career planning and development because their parents had pushed them to do so and that their parents were their main, one of their biggest main supports, um, among <laughs> sources of emotional support. Uh, many pieces of research, many pieces of existing research says that parents can be the university's greatest ally in career education. And if you can educate the parent, you can educate the student. 
I also created mock-ups of what some of these posts may look like, and it included the new logo and um, some friendly wording inviting students to come out to career planning and development and uh, develop themselves professionally. So my second insight, nope, that was right, so cool. My first, second insight was that many freshmen do not feel the need to engage with career planning and development because they are nowhere near graduating. My third proposal suggested centralizing an existing event, which is the Pizza with Professors event, to the new Enterprise Center. This event would be run by career planning and development uh, before the fall semester in order to bring together every professor from every academic discipline with the incentive of food, because who doesn't like food, and would provide an early touch point with career, career planning and development staff alongside their new professors in order to prevent the, the fear of the unknown. So my final insight was that students would like major specific advice opportunities from working individuals in their goal careers. My final proposal was for career planning and development to sponsor the creation of Panther Panels, which would um, was for <laughs> ah, sorry, which would be held before fall registration in order to allow working faculty and alumni to come out and connect with jury students. These working professionals would provide, would provide advice that would be hard to get on the internet and would give a working model to students who expressed to us that sometimes their majors would, uh, were, and their career goals were hard to conceptualize, such as architecture or law. So this project was a great opportunity for me to merge my passion for graphic and logo design with my professional skills in communication, which is really what Jury Fusion is all about. I appreciate, being, I appreciate being able to acquire some real world, world experience in data research and analysis and created a campaign for a client that I knew was informed and actionable. Career planning and development offers a great many services to students like me. And this campaign aimed to educate our students about them so that when jury graduates, jury, <laughs> jury students graduate, they have the tools to successfully transfer from being a student to um, a productive working professional. I'd like to thank Dr. Regina Waters for the opportunity to work on this project, which is something that will definitely help me answer the question of what I am going to do after I graduate. Thank you. So the next speaker is Grant Umloff, who is also a fifth year architecture major, and he will share uh, aspects of his thesis project, which he will finalize in the coming days. Um, I like Grant's title of his thesis project a lot. It's uh, Foster Care Reform by Design. And that um, says a lot about what we ask architecture students to do with the thesis, which is take on a big, difficult issue and test the capacity of design to engage and perhaps help with that issue. Um, Grant is really well equipped to do this. He's been highly involved in community issues during his time um, in school with us. He's been uh, a volunteer and I think also an intern with the organization called Better Block Springfield that works to try to improve quality of life issues for uh, Springfield's urban core. Um, He's also interned with BRP Architects and Dake Wells Architecture, and he'll begin a full-time position with Dake Wells um, after graduation. Um, Grant also last week was honored by the uh, American Institute of Architects with a, an award for professional and design promise. So um, uh, welcome and thank you, Grant Umloff. Check one, two. Well, hello, uh, and a great introduction <laughs> that was. Um, so titled Foster Care Reform by Design, uh, which mainly focuses on tackling spatial and developmental gaps and critical care lever support for transitioning use. So care lever is a term used to define youth who have been in the foster care system at the age of 18. They are emancipated, um, so they may not have um, housing lined out. Um, or support systems to kind of continue um, their career path, goals, dreams. Um, and when I was kind of stumbling across um, ideas for um, these kind of big world projects that needed to be tackled, um, I came across this list of statistics that really just kind of blew me away. So for example, 
half of care leavers will find gainful employment by 24. Um, 70% will be involved in the juvenile justice system at some point. 50% are likely, will not graduate from high school and only 3% from college. And this list just kind of continued to go on and on. Um, and so that kind of struck me. Um, and I was really interested in learning more about the history of child welfare over time, how this started with orphanages as kind of the initial response um, to deal with youth that either had one, none parents, or their parents were out in battle, um, and then to foster care, how that became more of like a personalized experience for youth, um, but really how today um, this underprivileged uh, demographic is still struggling. So, so yeah, that's, that's um, kind of the, the conclusion of, of this thesis through different um, amount of research articles and everything else that have been looked at. Um, so how, the, uh, excuse me, foster care is more about kind of short-term placements and reintroducing the kids back into their birth families, um, but really this has kind of become inadequate permanent care um, for them until they turn 18. Um, so they currently don't have spaces to live, educate, career, uh, pursue career opportunities, and support peers. Um, so my site chosen um, is a neighborhood in Cincinnati, Ohio. Ohio is number four in the U.S. and youth transitioning out of foster care um, and in Hamilton County, which is in Cincinnati, 110 youth each year transition out. Um, if you're more familiar with Over the Rhine, um, Over the Rhine is just north of downtown Cincinnati. It was named um, the most dangerous neighborhood in America in 2009. Um, and since then has kind of received some major gentrification efforts. Um, but as this right diagram uh, may suggest, the south side of Liberty Street, a four or five lane highway that splits the two parts of the neighborhood, um, the north side still hasn't really received uh, much of, of anything. Um, and this is where I chose to um, pick my site, kind of along a main north-south corridor, um, but also helps kind of reach out to the, the demographic that need. Um, so top left is a uh, image of a police, police brutality scene that happened in Over the Rhine in 2009. Um, and then below that is kind of what the north side of Over the Rhine looks like today abandoned, boarded up, um, historic German architecture. Um, and then on the bottom side is what the south side of that neighborhood looks like. So you can kind of see the contrast there. Um, so again, my site kind of located um, along this kind of main north-south corridor. It's a main public transport um, corridor. And a big portion of my research really taught me that um, these, this youth kind of demographic needs public amenities to survive. Um, so along with this, this was chosen because of the public transportation, but just the amount of amenities nearby that they have access to, community centers, markets, um, universities, um, healthcare facilities, et cetera. Um, so program-wise, um, there are a lot of requirements that care leavers need to succeed. Um, stable housing, education, employment, uh, and social, kind of the, the main focus of what I'm trying to do spatially to help um, this demographic, but um, also cultural norms, healthcare, um, individual and shared spaces, and personal agency are, are, are vital. And there's a lot of things that they need help with. Um, so uh, kind of my, my main goal here is that um, it be more um, campus-like, interwoven into the city. I, I want um, the youth to feel like the city is their home. And, and, and the way that this is oriented, um, I, I, I think it achieves that. Uh, and there is a sense of beginning to end um, as uh, the end goal is personal agency, independency, um, to kind of continue a successful life into adulthood. Um, so a couple architectural precedents I looked at. Um, the Amsterdam Orphanage by Aldo van Eyck is one of the most um, popular modern orphanage um, of the 21st century. Um, it was kind of structured around like an internal city campus-like, um, and Aldo van Eyck really focused on the space between um, so it's kind of a modular system, and it understands how um, these different aspects communicate with each other. And then also the Big Ham Leatherbury Wise Place by Digsaw. This is in Philadelphia, important in my project because it is also in a very historic district. Um, so this project kind of playfully recreates what the row house um, looks like. So it modifies, rotates, um, and kind of creates a playful experience around it. So this pushed me to my design, which is this semester, which uh, for me is just really habitually sketching. Um, this is where I get all of my ideas out on paper, get to explore immediate context, and this happens both in plan, uh, 3D, 
section, elevation, um, just <laughs> whatever feels natural. Um, and um, yeah, so you can kind of see um, how, how this roof plan may sit on top of, of, of my specific site. Um, and just kind of quick um, party diagram. It's really just this main kind of social connector that stitches together this block urban fabric of the city and runs across this main um, public transport um, corridor uh, road that really calls out and tries to destigmatize what is happening both in this youth life, but also kind of what a healthy living environment could look like and, and really kind of accept, celebrate that. So here are just some plans kind of showing um, some of the kind of spaces that I included in this. Um, so the main idea of this is really just being shared spaces. Um, so um, kind of recreating some traditional house typology. So um, lobby entry, um, but there's also things like front yards, living rooms, um, kitchenettes, um, really spaces for them to socialize as that was kind of the biggest thing for my, my research. Um, but also um, you can kind of see these north to south um, extensions from the social connector that begins to reach out to these other buildings so that they are interconnected and this becomes more of like an internal system. Yeah, so here's just a couple of renderings that are un unfinished until next week, but you can kind of begin to see um, some of the spatial orientation of, of this project that I've been talking about. Top left is kind of this middle piece that hangs over the road and this is really becomes like the central living room for them. Um, library study space, how this begins to look as you see it um, inter white, inter inter <laughs> intertwine yeah, uh, between uh, this kind of historic uh, existing urban fabric um, and really the proportions of it. So what happens on that first level also can create like an open front yard porch and then the two stories above that. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Emily Oliver is another one of our standout students in the communication department. In fact, she won the outstanding overall communication student in our department this year. So that was a, I'll give you a big applause for that. That is a big honor. It's, it's the highest honor we offer over in Shoemaker. Um, she's also set herself apart in other ways. She's been president of her sorority, Pi Beta Phi. Um, she also has had internships in the field uh, in Rebel, working with Rebel Advertising. Um, she's also a double major, strategic communication and graphic and digital design. In the communication program, every student goes through our capstone experience, which is senior seminar. And the goal of that is to show us what you know. Um, and you, it's up to you to do this self-directed project that really shows what you've learned over the previous four years. And the best projects combine personal passion with professional goals. And the one that really knocked it out of the park this year is Emily's project called Pairing for Sharing. For as long as I can remember, I've been told I look like my mother. We have the same hair, same nose, and even the same personality. Some would say we're quite the pair. Many things come in pairs. Mother and daughter, peanut butter and jelly, macaroni and cheese, and even your kidneys. The last one is the reason why I'm here talking to you today. Last year, my mom, Carol Oliver, was diagnosed with end-stage renal disease. Long story short, this diagnosis means she has to have a new kidney. When I, we got this news, it was overwhelming. Our once normal weeknights were replaced by dialysis treatments, doctor's appointments, and medications. Seeing her go through this journey opened my eyes to how common kidney diseases are, so when it ca came time to choose a senior seminar project, I knew what to do. The National Kidney Foundation helps provide early detection screenings and vital patient and community services. With 37 million Americans currently living with kidney disease and 80 million at risk, the work that they are doing is so important. My vision for this project was to raise awareness for the National Kidney Foundation through interactive social media content about kidney diseases and steps to become an organ donor. 
In addition, I had a goal to raise money and to give back to the organization that has helped my family. My goal? To raise $3,000 for the National Kidney Foundation and have a turnout of 50 people at the event. So let me tell you about my journey throughout this project. When I first pitched the idea of focusing my senior seminar on kidney disease research and awareness, my mom thought it was a fantastic idea. Another way we are quite the pair is our shared love of event planning, so she wanted to support in any way that she could. She was my sounding board throughout the project. Every idea had to go through her. I first reached out to the executive director at the St. Louis branch of the Nas National Kidney Foundation, who provided resources to help me get started. I also reached out to family and friends to find others affected by kidney diseases. After doing this research and meeting with these individuals, I ultimately decided to host a wine dinner fundraiser as the best way to raise awareness and funds. The next phase of the project was developing branding by designing a logo and creating the project name as well as the color scheme. I also created promotional items such as tickets, flyers, posters, and social media content. And oh, let me go back. To um, spread the word, I created an Instagram page at Pairing for Sharing and a Facebook event page. I also set up a fundraising page on the National Kidney Foundation website and created a QR code for user accessibility. The event itself is a five course wine pairing dinner at Gilardi's restaurant owned by James Martin with wine pairings provided by Colin Yates and Kelly Nikes. I had nine sponsors and 16 auction items. There was live music and entertainment provided by Chris Albert who generously donated his time and skills. The event was capped off with guest speakers, Chris Play, Mike Play, and my mother. Chris and Mike spoke about their experience with kidney donation between family members as recipient and donor respectively. My mom talked about her specific type of kidney disease, which is polycystic kidney disease, the challenges it poses and the treatment for it. My original goal was to raise $3,000 and to have a turnout of 50 people at the event. I ended up raising $17,370 with 54 people attending the event. I would have never believed the amount of success from this project, and this showed me that focusing personal, a personal project has a much larger, larger impact because not only I was passionate about it, but my friends, family, and community became passionate about it as well. After the event, multiple people got tested to see if they could be a kidney donor match for my mom, but unfortunately, we have not found one yet. However, this highlights the impact that every con contribution can make, no matter how small. In more ways than I first realized, this project was always about pears. My mom and I, food and wine, and a pair of unhealthy kidneys. The fundraiser is over, but there is still a lot to be done. One of the biggest difference makers for kidney disease is organ donation. There are over 100,000 people waiting for kidney donation at any given time, including my mom. The average wait time is three to five years for almost all patients, and some patients don't have that time. This month, right now, is Donate Life Month, so I encourage you to sign up to be an organ donor and consider getting tested to be a live donor. Uh, both links are available at the QR code up there. Thank you. Wow, that was amazing. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I want to introduce myself. My name is Juan Rodriguez. Uh, students call me Dr. J-Rod. That's easier. Uh, here is Abby Halberg. So just a uh, few things about Abby. Uh, she is from Lee Summit, Missouri, and joined Drury in the fall of 2020. She is a junior, double major in finance economics. She's also a psychology minor, and she is pursuing a data analytics certificate, which is why she's here. Uh, she mentioned that she actually chose Drury for its small class size and the unique opportunities provided by it. 
Uh, she plans to graduate in May 2024, and she would like to pursue a career as a financial advisor or a financial analyst, and wants to continue using her Excel ex uh, skills to continue to analyze data. Her hobbies include reading, uh, hanging with friends, and cooking. Now, her project is uh, called COVID-19 Effects on Betas and S&P 500 Sectors. As she will explain, Beta is a financial concept that measures the expected movement of one asset class with the overall market. Uh, by uh, definition, Beta is considered to be equal to one. The proxy that we use uh, for the whole market is the S&P 500 index. And to put in things in perspective, if beta is equal to one, the market moves from one point. If we have a beta that's greater than one, you will move more than one. The market moves down one point, you move a little more. So a beta that's over one means that you actually move more than the market, which would be higher volatility. A beta that's lower than one means that you actually move a little less. That's less volatility. But a beta of neg that will be negative actually means that you move on the opposite direction than the market. So what she's doing is she, we know that on the long term, the markets are moving up. So all of the sectors tend to move up. But what happened during COVID-19? Well, she can tell us more about it. Well, here she is. Thank you for that introduction. Um, like Dr. J-Rod said, I pretty much looked at the stock market and how COVID-19 affected that. I know my title, I've been told, is kind of gibberish. So I'm gonna explain what exactly my project set out to do and how I did that. Okay, so just an outline. I'm gonna go over a project summary, give some background, because it is a lot of kind of definitions and technical words. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about the analysis of each sector and explain my results and related empirical studies that I found. So specifically, background, what is the S&P 500? So it was started in 1957 by a company actually called Standards & Poor's. Um, and so obviously the stock market looked a lot different then. We didn't have computers um, and cell phones and all of that. But now we know it today as you can go to pretty much anywhere online if you have internet connection and you can invest in the S&P 500 stock market. It is 500 publicly traded companies, which is where 500 comes from. Um, and it's included of 11 sectors. I'm not going to list them all because it's kind of a mouthful. But you can see there's 11 sectors, and those are comprised of over 68 industries within the market. So there's so many companies, so many industries, so many sectors, and they all comprise one stock market. So what is beta? Like Dr. J-Rod helped me out with. Um, he explained that beta, it should have a value of one. A perfect beta is one, so the S&P 500 market will always be one because that is our benchmark for that. So specifically, I looked at how often did the prices fluctuate in these sectors? Were they moving with the market? Were they moving in the opposite direction? What exactly was the behavior due to COVID-19? So specifically, you can see, like Dr. Jayrod also said, this is specifically just measuring short-term risk for investment. Overall, the stock market is always moving up and it's always improving in performance. So. Adjusted close is a very important number that I used in my data. I took the adjusted close and I calculated returns in Excel. And then from that, I got a beta value. So all of my beta values directly go back to adjusted close. That was the first value that I took to get to my results. And pretty much all it means is it takes into account corporate actions. So it takes um, dividends, stock splits, things like that, which can affect value. And usually adjusted close is pretty close to the regular closing price. So just when the stock market closes at, I believe it's 5 p.m. every day, then this is the closing price. And then they adjust for the corporate actions. So this is just a timeline. My data does start in 2018 and then it ends in 2023. January 30th, 2023 was the most updated data I could find from each sector. And I specifically went into Yahoo Finance and utilized their historical data to get all of my research and to clean it up and derive the values that I did. So pretty much I used Excel. I did all my work in Excel. I know it's everybody's favorite software, um, but personally I really like Excel and I used it I did different uh, statistical formulas, like I used a slope formula to get beta value, but I also ran a regression analysis, which gives you a bunch of statistical values. I just took one and focused on that one statistical value to find out a lot. So I'm sure even more research can be done on those other values derived to find even more out about the markets. 
So specifically, this is just some of my formulas. I know it looks super interesting, um, but this is just check figures that I got just to make sure that my regression analysis was working perfectly, that my data was all cleaned up, that I had the proper values all in the same timeline. So I did use three timelines. I used a whole timeline starting in 2018, going to 2023, and then I did pre-COVID and post-COVID, and my data um, says I found an article saying that the World Health Organization um, announced it as a global pandemic on March 11th, 2020. So that's when my COVID timeline starts. Um, so pretty much, yeah, this is a regression analysis, but the only value that I focused on was the highlighted one at the bottom. So that is the beta value, and I did that with three timelines for 11 sectors. So I got a lot of numbers. So this is kind of just all of the beta values. I know it's kind of a lot, but the main thing that I want um, you guys to take away and why this is important is because anybody can invest in the stock market. You have 500 publicly traded companies and you could invest just in one or two sectors and still you know, make a lot of money off of that. And that could be invested into retirement like Matthew's project talked about. Um, but the main thing I want to note is that there is a lot of betas post COVID that are negative which means specifically that COVID caused these sectors to move in completely different directions than uh, previously recorded. So previously we saw that most markets in general at least moved somewhat with the market. When the market value increased, um, their market price increased, so did that sector's price. Now a lot of those sectors are actually moving in the opposite direction of the market. This isn't necessarily a good or a bad thing. It just means that COVID-19 really did cause historical trends Obviously in healthcare, that's you know, not really surprising, but even sectors like um, financials and energy, the, all of those are now moving completely away from what we've seen pre-COVID, which is very interesting because obviously this is a global pandemic that not only affected the US, um, but we can see just in this one stock market how directly impacted we were. So yeah, just a pretty graph. So you can see obviously all the betas are one because this is our benchmark. Um, and you can see there's, on every graph I have on here, there's a sharp drop um, right when COVID is announced and then overall a slow rise back up. So these are the only betas that actually m moved and maintained a positive relationship with the market. So you'll see communication services, energy, materials, and real estate, they still move up when the market moves up. And a lot of them specifically, like 0.98, three of them, they're almost exactly nearing the market. So that's an ideal beta value. Um, uh, there's a lot of reasons, obviously, very, various contributions that would cause said relationships inverse and positive. Um, but those majority, you can see, majority of them actually are now negative and only a few remained positive. And then another pretty graph with, so those are just some industries that it's comprised of. And then again, more communication services and pretty graphs. I'm gonna skip ahead. So these, again, are all the negative relationships. I just kind of separated them so you can see the number um, that were negatively impacted. Um, yeah, so there's also a lot more industries in the sectors that were negatively impacted, so they have more opportunities for error, and some of these industries are considered larger or smaller, so there's obviously various size factors and market share issues um, that would affect these negative relationships. So I'm just gonna skip ahead, but pretty much, yeah, these are all just industries breaking down, giving a nice little visual. Okay, perfect. So my overall results. We can see that um, from the tables that I presented, uh, the COVID-19 did actually impact a lot of sectors and caused them to move historically. Seven of those sectors actually moved um, in a negative direction and now inversely related to the overall market. Um, three of them remain positive. They still have a positive relationship and they still move somewhat with the market. And then one of them actually it was um, fell due to COVID-19, the energy sector fell. And obviously this is due to the changes in income, specifically in the financial sector. We know there was a lot of stimulus checks being given by the government. People had less disposable income for luxury goods. Utilities were being used differently because we were home. We now revolutionized uh, Zoom. So technology and most of these sectors that we know were really just being used completely differently. And this is again, not a good or a bad thing. It just shows that this is a completely new movement that definitely needs to be observed. Um, and we're only a couple years out really from the main peak of COVID. But yeah, I just found some other empirical studies looking at the S&P 500 um, just to analyze theirs. 
sectors and a lot of them just kind of looked at how does sectoral investment really impact and help people. Um, and the main takeaway that I found from just the data and the empirical studies was that um, analyzing the sectors of a market can be extremely helpful and it can really show you how to diversify that investment and that the stock market really is for everyone. You don't have to be a finance and economics double major to understand it. Um, you can just go and you can look and there's a lot of great articles explaining how the stock market's doing so you don't have to look at these weird numbers. You can go read for yourself what exactly the stock market is doing and it's constantly changing, constantly going up. So yeah, I find this uh, really interesting. I hope you guys liked it. Good afternoon, my name is Ryan Gordon. I'm a faculty member here at Drury University in the Department of Biology, and I am here to present or introduce Natalie Morgan, who's a student in the Department of Biology. So Natalie has worked in my lab for about a year. Um, she started last spring when I asked her if she was interested, and she was kind enough to say yes. Um, and to date, Natalie has been awarded several research grants for this project, um, and last, early in March, she presented data from this project at the annual meeting of the local chapter of the American College of Sports Medicine, which is a collection of universities from Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and uh, Kansas. Outside of the lab, Natalie has kept pretty busy, so she competes for Jury's triathlon team here at the university. She is currently the president of the Exercise Physiology Club uh, at Drury, which has just started this year, so she's been getting it engaged and initiated and getting all types of events lined up. Um, and this year she also represented Drury in an undergraduate quiz bowl type competition in which Drury competed against a number of universities at the same conference that we went to, um, along with a few others, but she was part of that team and they did quite well. Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce Natalie and her topic, um, her research proposal and discussion is looking at blood flow restriction and its effects on cardiovascular health. So we all know that exercise is extremely beneficial for us. I mean, our parents, doctors, professors, everyone pretty much tells us that we should prioritize exercise and that the best way we can do that is by going for a run, a bike ride, a hike, or anything along those lines. But what happens if because of disease, old age, or injury, we aren't able to do those exercises? How would we stay physically healthy then? So this is the question that we aim to tackle in our research. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Natalie Morgan, and today I'll share with you my honors research project that compares the effects of cycling endurance exercise and blood flow restriction resistance exercise on our cardiovascular health. So first, we're going to look at endurance and resistance exercise and how the two might differ. So endurance exercises are the types of activities that increase our breathing and heart rate. So running, bike riding, swimming, these are all exercises that fall under that umbrella and are often associated with improvements in our mitochondrial content, oxidative capacity, and in promoting angiogenesis, which I'll come back to in a moment. Resistance exercise, on the other hand, are the types of activities that we typically do at the gym using weights. And these are associated with improvements in our skeletal muscle mass, neuromuscular adaptations, and ultimately increases in our muscular strength. So if your goal is to become stronger, then resistance exercise is definitely what you should be doing. But if you want to improve your cardiovascular health, then endurance exercise is by far the more recognized and well-appreciated method of accomplishing that. So you might be wondering at this point, what is blood flow restriction resistance exercise and where does this come into the equation? So blood flow restriction resistance exercise is a relatively new form of training and it's where you perform resistance based activities while wearing a cuff that restricts blood flow to your extremity. And this provides a pretty unique effect as not only does it temporarily reduce blood flow to your extremity while you are exercising, but it also then promotes a rapid increase in blood flow once the cuff is actually released. So previous literature has shown us that blood flow restriction resistance exercise can promote skeletal muscle growth in a similar way to typical resistance exercise, but importantly, it accomplishes this at much lower loads. 
So in this sense, it's often used in the rehabilitative setting for people who are recovering from injuries and wanting to slowly improve their muscle mass and strength. And while research in this area is pretty well developed, there is currently very little known about how this type of exercise may affect our cardiovascular function, which is what we were primarily interested in our study. So specifically, we wanted to look at angiogenesis as one aspect of cardiovascular health. And angiogenesis is the growth and formation of new blood vessels, as you can see in this little image. And we know that circulating microRNA 126 and 222, as well as vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF, are two factors that have been shown to promote angiogenesis in response to endurance exercise. And so our prediction was that because of its unique effects on blood flow, blood flow restriction resistance exercise could also promote VEGF and circulating microRNAs 126 and 222 expression in a similar way to endurance exercise and ultimately play a role in promoting angiogenesis. So if we go back to the original question then, our hope was that if this form of exercise could be shown to elicit similar adaptations at the cardiovascular level to endurance exercise, that it could be then given to those members of our population who are unable to participate in typical endurance exercise, but for which exercise is often prescribed to them as a means of recovery and rehabilitation. So this includes older adults, those with skeletal muscle injuries, cardiovascular disease, and with types of dysautonomia like long COVID. So Importantly, the low load requirements of blood flow restriction resistance exercise in the sense that you can perform these activities while lifting lighter loads would be applicable for these populations and could provide a more realistic but hopefully just as beneficial form of exercise for them. So if we move on to the data collection results from our study, we had participants visit, visit the exercise science lab on three separate occasions during their time with us. In the first visit, we collected a series of measurements and had them perform some baseline testing. And then in their second visit, we randomly assigned them to either the blood flow restriction resistance exercise session, where they used the equipment that you can see up on the top of the screen, or they were assigned to the cycling endurance exercise session where they cycled on the cyclogometer for 30 minutes. And then when they came in for their third and final visit, we simply had them complete the remaining exercise protocol. And importantly, during both of these second and third visits, we collected blood immediately prior immediately after exercise, and then one and two hours post-exercise so that we could analyze the circulating microRNA and VEGF expression. And in terms of results, what we see so far is pretty promising. So these graphs show us a couple of things, but mainly they show us that while the average RPE for both exercise sessions was similar, and RPE is pretty much how tired the participants felt while they were exercising, we see that the average heart rate values and the blood lactate values for the blood flow restriction resistance exercise session were slightly lower than for the cycling session. And this is really encouraging, especially when we think about the potential application of this type of exercise for the at-risk people like those with cardiovascular disease or the elderly, for which exercising at a lower heart rate and with lower blood lactate values would certainly be ideal. And in terms of VEGF, we see no significant difference across the board in VEGF response between the two modalities. But again, this is really encouraging because we know that VEGF is a primary driver of angiogenesis in response to endurance exercise. And so the fact that we see comparable results with blood flow restriction shows us that it could also promote angiogenesis and ultimately replace endurance exercise down the track for those populations. And finally, if we look at circulating microRNA 126, we see that its expression is highly sensitive to the blood flow restriction resistance exercise session, which is really encouraging. But on the other hand, we see microRNA 222 is not very expressive. This could be for any number of reasons, and ultimately because of the small sample that we've been able to analyze so far, it's difficult to draw any real conclusions at this stage of our data analysis. So ultimately, the whole point of our project was to determine the effects of blood flow restriction resistance exercise on markers associated with our cardiovascular health and specifically angiogenesis. And so far, what we've seen is really encouraging. We see that there are some similarities between the two exercise modalities, and if this continues down the track, we hope that it can then be applied for those members of our population that I've mentioned already today. And a couple of acknowledgements before I wrap up to Dr. Gordon and Abby Robinson and everyone else who helped out in the lab this year. Um, of course, the participants who gave us their time as well. And then the Central States chapter of the American College of Sports Medicine for their research grant that they awarded us. And then of course, Drury University for their research grant as well that helped to fund our research and the Department of Biology and the Honors Department for their ongoing support throughout all this. 
So thank you very much. <laughs> That concludes our Fuse Talk session. Let's give our participants one more round of applause. Before you leave, I just want to share one more thing. I think one of the things that you saw in the session today is just the wide variety of exceptional work that's taking place all across our campus. And these nine students just exemplify the work that's taking place um, in all of our classrooms with all of our faculty. I also want to thank uh, all of the faculty mentors who made this, these projects possible for our students. Um, without them, um, none of this happens. Um, I would like to invite you uh, to O'Reilly Family Event Center um, in the next about 15 minutes. Uh, SGA will be giving away some prizes uh, on the raffle with raffle, uh, and there's some food and snacks. And then um, join us for uh, what ends the student part uh, of a Fusion Day, which is a fantastic poster session. Uh, on the floor of the arena. Thank you for coming.